Spotted lanternfly is an invasive insect that is present in eastern North America, but it's not yet here in Wisconsin. However, we're worried that it will be coming our way. So to learn a little bit more about spotted lanternfly and how you can help detect it, we've invited PJ Leash back to Wifton to tell us about this new insect. Pleasure to be here. So as we just heard, we have a new invasive insect species called the spotter lanternfly. It's in parts of eastern um, America, around Pennsylvania area, and I'll talk about the history of it here uh, momentarily, but it's something that's potentially knocking at our door and something that we should have on our radar. Um, and just a quick note about uh, exotic insects in Wisconsin. So at the UW Insect Diagnostic Lab, I regularly see on average about two to three new non-native insects show up. Some of these have very minor impacts. Some of them, uh, like your emerald ash borer and gypsy moth, can have really significant impacts um, out in the ecosystem or in agricultural settings and so on. And so the spotted lanternfly is one that is, again, in the eastern U.S., it's poised to uh, potentially make an appearance here at some point. Uh, hopefully it will be a while, but uh, this is definitely an insect that we should have on our radar and be on the lookout for. So a little bit about the spotted lanternfly. It's a really unique looking insect, and it's a type of plant hopper from the family Fulgoridae which is an unusual family for North America. We don't see too many species of it. If you go down towards the tropics, we see a greater diversity down there. This particular species, though, like Corma delicatula, is native to parts of northern China. It has spread and is acting as an invasive species in other parts of Asia, uh, such as Korea. It's been there for a little while. It's also been documented in Japan. And it showed up in the eastern U.S. in Pennsylvania back in 2014, and it spread around a little bit since then. I'll show you a map uh, coming up here in just a moment. Now a couple reasons that this particular species is a concern. The first is that it can be easily transported. The adults, the juveniles, uh, can potentially hitchhike on objects, plants, man-made objects, and so on. But the egg stage which is how they overwinter, um, can sometimes be on materials such as trees or firewood, although sometimes the adult females will lay eggs on man-made objects. And so if that man-made object were a crate or a vehicle or a trailer, and that gets moved across a state or across a country, that could be a route for dispersal. So we do have concerns because it can be very easily transported. It's also a concerning species because it feeds on a very, very wide range of plants. And thus far, it's been documented to feed on over 70 different plant species. And really, that list is incomplete at this point. It's going to go up over time as we have more observations with this particular species. But it's a concern for landscape and forest trees. But it's also a concern in the agricultural sector because certain fruit crops can be attacked. Tree fruit like apples, stone fruits like peaches and plums and cherries can be attacked and also it's a concern in the vineyard setting because grapes can be attacked as well and um, this one also it's uh, interesting because it's tied in it has a strong preference with an invasive tree uh, and this group is probably pretty familiar with this one the tree of heaven um, an invasive tree species um, and in its native range it uh, has a strong pef preference for this particular tree it likes to feed on it to pick up uh, some alkaloid toxins that it can incorporate into its body and use for uh, defense. So that's the basics about this particular species in terms of its current distribution. Uh, as we can see on the map here, it's been detected in about eight different states in the eastern U.S. And no surprise here when you look at invasive insects coming into the country, we often see them coming on, on one of the two coasts, so west coast or east coast. A lot of our historical invasive insects have come into the east coast area. In this case, it showed up in Pennsylvania in 2014, and we see there are four states shaded in red. Those are states where we have documented uh, established populations. There are four yellow states where the insect has been detected, but uh, we haven't seen signs of established infestation stations, although that is very likely to change over time. So that's the current snapshot of spotted lanternfly in the U.S. Again, over time, that insect may increase its range and potentially make its way to the upper Midwest, including Wisconsin. Now, luckily for an invasive species, one thing going for the spotted lanternfly is it's really easy to identify. There's basically nothing else that looks quite like this. Um, the adults are large, 
roughly an inch or so long. Males are a little bit smaller than females. Females might be just a hair over an inch long, but they're good size insects. They are generally related to things like cicadas, so if you look at the pictures here, it might remind you a little bit of a cicada in that regard. For the adults, the forewings have a pale gray, kind of ashy gray color with some really distinctive polka dots, and also towards the tips of their wings, I call it kind of a Morse code pattern. It's a series of dots and dashes, so very distinctive distinctive pattern on those forewings. The hindwings are even more distinctive. Black and white with a large, very distinctive pink patch with some black polka dots. There's also some yellow on the abdomen. So overall, um, no other insects in our area look like this. So at least it'll be very easy for us to identify. A little bit more about the biology of the adults. Even though they have wings, they're not strong flyers. They tend to kind of crawl where they're going. Um, so even though they do have wings, they tend to do most of their moving uh, by crawling around. And when the adults are out um, later in the year, they are mating and laying eggs generally in late summer or in fall. So kind of a, a peak period that's been identified in the eastern U.S. is roughly the month of October for egg laying. The eggs are fairly distinctive, although they, they can be a little bit tricky to identify. Now, now when the adult females lay eggs, she's typically going to lay an egg mass or two, and these egg masses might contain 30 to potentially up to 50 or so eggs, and the egg masses can be decent size, an inch uh, or more long. Uh, the eggs themselves are kind of brownish, but the individual eggs are covered with a gray waxy uh, protective coating. Uh, helps them prevent uh, from drying out, will protect them a bit during the winter, and so on. The problem with that gray coating, which we can see in this picture on the right, is it doesn't necessarily jump out as being from an insect. It looks kind of like putty or potentially mud or something like that. And so if this egg mass were located on something like a man-made object, it might be mistaken for something else. So again, this is one of the reasons why spotted lanternfly can be concerning, is these eggs could potentially be transported around. Now eventually that wax of coating kind of dissipates and, and disappears and the eggs would be exposed. That's generally uh, the following spring after making it through the winter. And then the juveniles would hatch out of those eggs and we'll talk about the juveniles next. But when the adult females lay eggs, it's often on plants. Strong preference for um, that tree of heaven. They will go to other trees. Uh, typically they prefer trees with smooth bark. Um, so they'll lay eggs on plants, although not always. Sometimes those eggs may be on man-made objects or other natural objects like rocks and things like that. And if you have a large population of spotted lantern flying in an area, you can easily get trees with dozens and dozens of these egg masses. Um, and so if those egg masses were, again, on a man-made object like a trailer, and there's dozens of them on there, you could easily transport hundreds or thousands of these insects around. So again, I just want to emphasize that potential for uh, invasion with this particular species. Here's what the juveniles look like. The juveniles, or nymphs as we would technically call them, um, they are small. Luckily, they are also very distinctly uh, colored and patterned. So nothing else really quite looks like this. When they first hatch out of the egg, um, they're going to be black with some white polka dots on the body. And the first uh, juvenile stage or instar is going to be small, uh, roughly about an eighth of an inch long or so. They will progressively get larger. They go through a total of four juvenile stages or instars. The first three are black with white polka dots. When they get to the fourth and final juvenile stage, they are reddish with black and white polka dots. And we can see that here on um, the bottom right-hand corner picture. Now in terms of the life cycle, um, they spend the winter as egg masses, um, so that's on the left of this uh, diagram. The eggs will hatch in about mid-spring or so, probably sometime in about May. Uh, again, out of those eggs we get our young instar juveniles, which are again black with some white spots on them. Um, and those are going to be feeding on plants from mid to essentially late spring, so that might get us into uh, June or so. In uh, June and early summer, we're going to see our late uh, stage juveniles, those late instar nymphs. Again, those are red and black with white polka dots, so those juveniles are very, very distinctive. And then eventually those late instar juveniles transform into the adult stage in about midsummer, roughly sometime in July. During that course of the year, though, the juveniles can be feeding. When we get adults, the adults will be feeding on plants, and then eventually those adults mate, and they're laying eggs in late summer 
uh, or into fall, so September or October for egg laying, and there's only one generation per year of spotted lanternfly. In terms of the damage and impacts from this, both the adults and juveniles have very similar mouth part anatomy. They have sucking type mouth parts, so their mouth parts essentially function like a hypodermic needle or a soda straw, so they're restricted really to a liquid diet, so they're not going to be chewing holes in uh, plants or, or chewing on the leaves or anything like that. Instead, they take their tube-like mouth parts, they pierce the bark of a plant, and this could be on branches or twigs and or the main trunk, and they're going to suck fluids out of the plant. And so the main thing that can happen, if it's severe feeding, we can get branch or twig dieback potentially. But we also see these oozing wounds where after the insect has fed, sap continues to ooze out. The insects themselves, they drink so much sap from the trees that when they excrete that, there's a lot of sugars left in there. And we call that honeydew. So you can have this sugary substance raining down from plants that have a lot of spotted lanterns fly in them. So those are the primary impacts. Secondary things that can also happen though, if we have all of this oozing sap or this excreted honeydew, there are some fungi that can grow on that. Things like black sooty mold and, and some other mold can grow on that uh, oozing sap and honeydew. Uh, we also can get nuisance insects. And these are things like your ants uh, in yellow jackets and things like that that are showing up simply because there is a readily available sugar source. So this would be the same kind of insects if you were to open a pop can and, and leave it out at a barbecue in, in August, you know, you're going to get those yellow jackets and, and ants and certain types of beetles going to it just for the, the sugars that are freely available. So again, we get this primary feeding and damage and it can cause some of these secondary impacts as well. And here's what that can potentially look like. So in this picture on the left, we see a tree that had been um, really fed on with a high population of spotted lanternflies. We have lots of oozing wounds at the base of that tree. And as a result, we get some of that secondary fungal growth uh, growing on that uh, sap that's oozing out. So that's some of the damage that we could see. Again, we might potentially see branch or twig die back if they're severe feeding. And just to show you how many of these insects we can get, this picture on the right is from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. This is a trunk of a large tree, and you can see all of those spotted lanternfly adults on there. There's literally hundreds or thousands of them on there, and so with the sheer numbers of them, they can cause a lot of damage to uh, plants in the landscape and in uh, fruit crop settings. And in terms of those host plants, I mentioned them briefly earlier. I said that uh, spotted lanternfly has a preference for Tree of Heaven if it's available. Luckily in Wisconsin, we don't see too many of those. Uh, other parts of the country, it can be much more prevalent, but it does prefer that host if it can find it. Otherwise, it can feed on a very wide range of landscape plants. I mentioned earlier in this video that spotter and lanternfly is recorded from over 70 different species of uh, trees and other plants. Uh, this can include maples, oaks, sycamores, um, beech, willows, walnuts, including black walnut, tulip tree, um, cottonwood, and other poplars, black locusts, uh, certain birches, and even things like rose bushes. And over time, this list will probably grow as we have more observations of uh, spotted lanternfly in the U.S. And as I mentioned, this uh, spotted lanternfly is also a concern for fruit crop growers because this insect can feed on uh, fruit trees like apples, uh, stone fruit like peaches, plums, and cherries can also feed on mulberry, and it's a concern for the grape industry as well. So again, it's an insect that can have an impact on a wide range of different plants. For next steps to wrap up here, again, I just want to reiterate that uh, as of 2019, uh, we have not found spotted lanternfly yet in Wisconsin or the Midwest region. It's restricted to uh, the eastern states around Pennsylvania and New York area, but it might show up on our doorstep at some point. If you'd like additional information about this insect, we do have a fact sheet a bulletin written up. It's available on the Extension Horticulture website, which is hort.uwex.edu, and that uh, URL is down in the lower left-hand corner. And it's a one-page front and back with additional information about um, how to identify this insect and the general biology of the insect as well. 
And also the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture or a DATCAP, D-A-T-C-P, is really gotten the spotted lanternfly on their radar. They love to hear of any um, potential or suspected reports. So DATCAP has put together a web page on spotted lanternfly. The link for that, the URL, is in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so if you are interested in additional information or if you think you may have found it, um, by all means, feel free to go to that website. They have um, information on how to report potential sightings by email or phone to Department of Ag. Otherwise, you can reach out through the UW Insect Diagnostic Lab or Wisconsin First Detector Network as well. So again, we haven't found it in the state yet, but definitely an insect to have on your radar. You mentioned that it overwinters as egg masses. I think one question that a lot of Wisconsinites will be interested in knowing is whether there's any evidence that extreme cold temperatures will limit the survival of those egg masses. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I'd have to dig in the literature to check and, and see if there's been some cold studies looking at mortality. My gut feeling, though, is based on where it's found in other parts of the globe, northern China, it's been detected up in the Korean Peninsula where, you know, it can get very cold there in the winter. It probably is fairly cold hardy just because it comes from similar latitudes and also it has that protective coating, that waxy covering over it. So um, hard to tell at this point, but uh, it probably is fairly cold hardy, I suspect. In terms of trying to detect this insect, you mentioned the nymphs are out kind of earlier in the summer, the adults you'll see later in the summer. Do the nymphs and adults feed on different host plants or are they feeding on that whole suite of plants all throughout their yes. summer season? My understanding is you could potentially find you know, some late stage juveniles and adults on the same plants. So they will feed on, on some of the same things. But uh, as I, I showed in one of the slides, it's really a pretty broad range of plants that they feed on. I would kind of add on to that though, you know, if folks are out there looking for invasive plants and they happen to encounter Tree of Heaven, might be something just to take a close look for this insect because of that known association as a, a preferred host for it. Yeah, and we'll be uh, um, sharing with all of our folks in the Wisconsin First Detector Network, we'll be sharing additional resources on how to identify Tree of Heaven. Um, as PJ mentioned, that is an invasive tree that's much more prevalent in the eastern United States, but we do have it in Wisconsin. And so you can do double duty as a first detector and map the Tree of Heaven and also help us look for a spotted lanternfly at the same time. Thanks again, PJ, for coming in and teaching us about another new insect. We hope that folks will keep their eyes out for spotted lanternfly. And as PJ mentioned, there's numerous ways you can report it if you see it. You can visit the DATCAP spotted lanternfly webpage to learn how to report directly to them. You can contact PJ at the Insect Diagnostic Lab or you can contact Wifton.